any semblance of iota of support that I had in middle school for being on a children's show uh, was completely out the window by the time we were 14 and 15. My friends were having sex at that point. And I was like, yeah, but I'm on a show hosted by an animated dog, so. Hello, and welcome to the Roast of Your Teenage Self podcast. I am your host, your roast coming queen, a girl who was always panicked at the disco, Elise Morales. And with us today, we have such a funny friend and comedian. She's a stand-up and writer. You've seen her work on Reductress, Vulture, The Onion, all the different places. But before all of that, she was a graduate of New Bedford High School. It's Taylor Garen. Hello, everyone. Beautiful, historic New Bedford, Massachusetts. Went to the public. Well, there were actually two public schools, and um, I went to the shittier one. So, okay. I love to talk about, this is something that I love to talk about, which is the reputation of different high schools sure. in a suburban area. Okay. So your high school was, was it the shittier one in the sense like in what way was it considered the shittier one? Okay, so this requires like greater context. And that is that I went to, I was born and raised in Massachusetts, um, which has some of the best schools in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately I lived in a city that had one of the worst schools in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> um, we were poor and there were a lot of immigrants and people of color, which is not super normal for Massachusetts. And so they were just like, give them, do what, do what you can. You know, we didn't have like, uh, the best schools. Um, but there was a vocational school and there was like just the regular public high school. And I went to the regular public high school, which was arguably worse because they were both of equal quality in terms of education, but one taught a trade. So you could <laughs> at least like learn how to do something. What flavor of high school was your high school? Okay. So we definitely, we had like your typical kind of uh, American high school tropes. Like there was a cheerleader, I believe there's a picture of me uh, in my cheerleading uniform. I know, I was gonna say, not only was there a cheerleader, we have one here on the podcast. Absolutely, today. look at, yeah, there we go. That's the troop. Look at me look down the there with my little bow. Um, yeah, I was a cheerleader my freshman year, both semesters. Uh, we went to competitions and we lost all the time. Um, because all of the other bigger high schools that had more money had people who had been in like gymnastics for so long who could do like backflips and shit. And we were like, like a ragtag group of <laughs> like, kids that they found in this poor town. We were, I'm not kidding, doing like somersaults. Like they gave us awards because they like felt bad for us. Like it was, it was really, it was kind of pathetic. Let's yeah. pull up the picture of you, like you're alone in your little cheer ensemble. So this is actually not a cheer ensemble. This was at um, a pep rally. I did have a lot of school spirit, um, but this was, I was in my cheerleading t-shirt, but this was actually uh, <laughs> our pep rally right before our, uh, every Thanksgiving we had a big like bonfire at the local park and we had oh. to make, each class would make a, like a float that they would, and we had like a big competition and we'd like ride on the float to the park, which was up the street. It was very, it was very sweet. I'm loving the hair of the boy next to you thank you that's mark he's still my very close friend oh shout well, out to mark here. here yes i'm in a group chat with him to this day love him very much i, um, I love when a current friend makes uh makes an appearance yeah it's a beautiful thing so were you like i mean you're a cheerleader so obviously professionally you're being school spirited but were yeah. you like into the events the pep rallies the football games all of that stuff I will say that I was only a cheerleader for a year and it was because uh, when we were practicing right before a competition, I got thrown up into the air and simply forgotten about. Um, and I fell and I fractured my wrist in several places. Um, and I didn't know until after I'd already competed on it in tears te streaming, it was simply, it was the drama, which I loved. Um, and so I went to the doctor after competition, after we lost that competition uh, yet again. And I had a cast on for a little while. So I will say that up for nothing. You oh, sure. <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> for no reason I had a broken wrist now. Um and let's say that killed my school spirit a, a bit. Um because school spirit literally cost me uh the structural integrity of my left wrist. <laughs> but <laughs> I did 
I got it back. I loved um, kind of school spirity things. And it's because I was, I didn't smoke or drink or date. And so I had to find something to throw my identity into. And it happened to be like clubs and school stuff and trying to distract myself from what it turned out was just like an existential uh, kind of dread that I felt, but I didn't, I couldn't identify it at the time. That, I feel like that is a, um, a common refrain in like, as, as far as the podcast goes, is like, well, I was deeply, deeply troubled by the world around me. And yeah. so I joined a lot of clubs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I literally, I was like, um, president of the international club. I was elected to the student advisory council or the SAP. <laughs> uh, we love to make that. I also did the morning announcements. Everyone fucking hated me. I was the worst. Now that I'm thinking a lot, I was like, not fun. So you were the announcements girl. Did you, did you try to make them fun? Or did I did. And it was every, okay. My school day started at 7 25 AM, which was way too early, but every morning I'd have to get there 10 minutes early so I could go to the office, read what the announcements were, and then announce them over the intercom. And every single day I said, good morning, New Bedford high school. <laughs> and at one point I ran for class secretary mm -hmm. and one of my very well-intentioned friends went from home, home room to home room being like, vote for my friend, Taylor. Um, you know her, she's the one who does the morning announcements. And everyone was like, I'm absolutely not voting for her now. She's like, <laughs> wakes me up at 7.25 in the morning, absolutely not. I lost, not kidding, I lost that secretary race to the weed dealer at my high school. <laughs> Actually, this guy helps us. Yeah, this, uh, this girl annoys us. This guy drives a hot pink uh, Honda Pilot with magenta flames off the side, up the side that he inherited when his sister went to college and sells weed out of it. Well, here's what I'm going to say is that even if you weren't the annoying morning announcements girl, that's hard to beat. That's yep. a hard guy to beat because I number agree. one, as a drug dealer, we know that he's handling money. Yeah. And we know that he is running a business mm -hmm. actually. And so ultimately he is qualified and he's got a cool car. So that's just really hard. And, you know, he's interacting with like kind of people of all ages, uh, demographics, like co colors, creeds, right. uh, backgrounds, uh, grades in school. So really he's, he was a man of the people. We are also still friends. All of these people are still in my hometown and I'm still good friends with all of them. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, retroactively, I do feel that we have to support his campaign, not that you wouldn't have made a great treasurer. Um, <laughs> I thinking about the, the morning announcements were such an interesting aspect of school. Did you have to say that were you the, the person who said the pledge as well? Yes, was but it was on only on Mondays that we did the pledge and I said it on Mondays and then I had to play from a very shitty kind of janky old tape player, uh, the national anthem. And I didn't, oh. even, I just held a little microphone up to it. You did pledge it. and anthem. Yeah, we did, but we loved, we loved America there. We also loved um, taking the uh, recently pregnant teenage girls from our local Catholic school because they sent them to our school too. <laughs> Today's episode of the Roast of Your Teenage Self podcast is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is delicious. I, I don't really I don't really know what else what else to say about it. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's it's a tasty treat that I love to eat, and that's a rhyme that I just made up out of the love that is in my heart for Magic Spoon. Growing up, cereal was one of the best parts of being a kid, but I had to give it up because I realized that it was full of sugar and junk that you really shouldn't eat. I've personally been trying to cut down on carbs and sugar and unhealthy foods. I'm getting married next year, et cetera, et cetera. And I realized that I basically can't eat anything anymore except for Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon has zero grams of sugar, 11 grams of protein, and only three net grams of carbs in every serving. They've got four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted, and blueberry. It tastes amazing, honestly, legitimately too good to be true. They've got a variety pack. You can get all four of the flavors. All of the flavors are equally good, but personally, I really like the blueberry. I'm a blueberry girl. Magic Spoon is also keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, low-carb, and GMO-free. 
I don't really, I, 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 at, th at this point, it's hard. It's really hard to think of anything else to say that would convince someone that they should try Magic Spoon. It's tasty. It's not extremely bad for you. There you go. How many things are that? Not many, okay? So go to magicspoon.com slash roast to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code ROAST at checkout to get free shipping. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash roast and use the code ROAST for free shipping. We thank Magic Spoon for being a sponsor of this podcast. Shout out to Bishop <laughs> They were banished to public school. They literally, like, if you got pregnant at Bishop Stang High School, they were, they very discreetly sent you to New Bedford High School. We had a, I'm not kidding, we had a daycare in our school. It was a class that you could take where you could, like, learn early childhood, like, education, but really it was just, like, we had so many pregnant girls at our school that would have babies and continue to have to come to school that they could send them to daycare at school. That, so... First of all, I actually think that that's a brilliant program. I agree. And I think to be, and as somebody who considers himself very socialist leaning, that socialism is, if I could, if I've ever named something. I wonder how many schools have that. Cause I feel like I always heard tell of like, and also it's like, this is like, it was always said in like a very racist way, but it's like, sure, there sure, are some sure. schools where like they have to have a daycare. Yeah, it really all, did. Uh, all the <laughs> teens and we see, you know, it's funny. <laughs> so, I was on the opposite end of that spectrum I think because I went to like a poor school in like a in like a uh a poor area with lots of uh poor people mm -hmm. um and so there I was like I heard tell of schools where they were like oh there's schools that have um like model UN <laughs> <laughs> Damn. right I did do model UN I did do model UN and you know what it's as sexy as the teen dramas make it. I would have gotten, I would have lost my virginity way younger if there was Model UN at my school. All the boys got those little ties on. And I'm a talker, so I, <laughs> I would have seduced them all. I guess my kind of UN, my Model UN was drama club. After I, after my very severe uh, cheerleading injury, I left athletics in my past, um, deeply in the past. And I joined drama club and it turns out that's where I, that's where I belong. What plays did you do? Okay. This is an important segment. Yeah. Uh, like we should uh, make it just an official segment of the podcast at this point because yeah. <laughs> most people, it's always me being like, I was Glinda in Wizard of Oz. Now tell me all the plays that you were in. <laughs> oh, wait, you were Glinda? Oh right. yeah. Okay. 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 So Wizard, Wizard of Oz was actually two years before me. Um, and the lead was a black girl and she played Dorothy and she went on to be on American Idol, Samantha Johnson. She's great. Whoa. Town hero. We love her. She's beautiful. She's talented. She's amazing. That um, is fucking cool. Yeah. She's great. Yeah. I was, um, Violet Beauregard in your, in you're a good man. No, not what's your, if Violet, you're in a, you're a good man. I was going to say you're a good man, Charlie Brown, but that was later. I was Violet Beauregard in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. That's and so I got cool. to wear, um, a matching purple velvet jumpsuit with this other actress who played my mom. It was great. I loved it. That's um, fun. And I was in the front page of the paper dressed as like a giant blueberry. They like made this, um, giant plywood blueberry with like a ladder on the back that I had to like hop up and like put my little hands and paint my face blue. Um, and that's how they put me in the newspaper. My mom still has it cut out. So <laughs> this is so hard. Why did you just me? Um, I was, uh, Lucy Van Pelt and you're a good man, Charlie Brown. Oh, that was a part that I always wanted. And I always wanted our school to do it. And so, the only we reason we did it was because we were, we were planning on doing how to succeed in business without really trying and not enough men tried out. So we had to, so we had to, we like switched last minute. It was very funny. It is funny to like even go there and be like, no, we're going to do that. When like, I feel like every theater program is so female heavy. We had a couple of guys, but they, it was like, we actually had twin, twin brothers. Um, and we had this one guy who I dated Patrick for a while. Um, he left me for this other girl in drama club and that's okay. They just got engaged. They're still together 11 years later. Can you believe? Oh my God. A drama relationship lasted the test of time. 
Yeah. And you know what? If you leave me and you end up with someone who you get married to, good for you. I'm so, especially if you marry your high school sweetheart, because you got yours, really. You know? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I mean, how emotionally distressed was Teen Taylor as this situation was going down? Oh, it was the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Worst mm-hmm. thing that's ever happened to me. Um, and it was when we were still together, I was like, you have a crush on Kamisha, don't you? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, thank you for being honest. I was like trying to be a good communicator. I was like, thank you for being honest with me. Thank you for saying that. Like, we can work through this. And then he dumped me like a week later um, for her. And I'm happy. And, and it was, was it one of those ones where like he dumps you and then it's like next day in school like he's whole, he's got her backpack on or something he was trying to be i think they were trying to be discreet about it but they were not being discreet about it and everyone in drama club loved this other girl so i could i didn't have the space to be like sad about it you know she was like such a sweetheart everyone loved her so i, I would have been like that huge bitch if i was like mad about it but yeah, then, then also he did high school, school musical Oh, oh my then god! He was in High School Musical, and he played the lead. He played Zac Efron's role, um, Troy Troy Bolton, Troy um, Bolton. and he could not hit any of his high notes. So that was my um, kind of revenge. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk more about your extracurricular journey because we're saying you did cheerleading, mm-hmm. you moved to drama, mm-hmm. but I think it's time now to talk about how before all of this, you did have an acting career. Yeah. Um, on a television show that is beloved to many in, <laughs> in my age group, you were on Zoom. I was on a show called Zoom, which was on PBS Kids. I originally actually filmed it in the summer after seventh grade, even though I absolutely look like I'm six years old in that picture for some reason. I was. Yeah, well, I would say person. you look like a baby. Yeah, I was like a full 13 year old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was wholly 13. Absolutely um, would have guessed seven. <laughs> I, did. I was I've always kind of just looked young you know it's the, it's the tight it's the taut skin it's just so dewy after I did zoom we actually I did a different show for PBS called fetch with rough Ruffman, which was a reality show for children um and it was hosted by an animated dog uh <laughs> and I honestly so when I, I was still in middle school when zoom came out and so the idea that I was on like tv was really cool to my friends like my friends were all very excited um, I made like the paper. It was all very fun. And then the next summer I was like, oh, okay. So if I can shoot this other TV show going into high school, I'm going to be all set in high school. Everyone's going to want to be my friend. I'm going to be that girl who was on TV. Um, yeah. it did not turn out that way, at least I'm going to tell you, <laughs> it did not turn out that way. <laughs> so while you're in middle school, people mm-hmm. are like, yo, you're on zoom. That's yeah. fucking up. It was, I mean, some of the, some of my friends were already like, smoking weed at that point so like they were like sure we're, we support you because like we're your friends or whatever but that any semblance of iota of support that I had in middle school for being on a children's show uh was completely out the window by the time we were 14 and 15 and I was still on a children's show yes my friends were having sex at that point and I was <laughs> like yeah but I'm on a show hosted by an animated dog so <laughs> <laughs> um uh, yeah, okay, you guys spent last night getting drunk. I spent this morning with Ruff Ruff. <laughs> <laughs> Not to uh, brag, but <laughs> I do have to go to a promotion and I do have to learn a choreographed dance and it is, the target audience is four to six year olds. So <laughs> this is cool. This is like really cool. Yeah, I thought it would make me so many friends. I thought it would make me so popular and it did the exact opposite. So I, I took it upon myself to get popular and that's why I joined the drama club. <laughs> So was, was cheerleading like a direct, you were like, oh, we need to pivot hard. My I career that, is not um, doing what I needed it to do for me socially. Like we're going full cheerleader. It probably was. Um, I, in my head, I did it because my older cousin who was like my, one of my closest friends was on the squad. And so I was like, I want to do whatever Morgan does. Um, she's also in this picture where she, <laughs> all the way to the right with the big rosy cheeks. And so she brought you, she yeah. brought you into the squad. Yeah. So I was like, okay, this will be cool. Um, and it was, I definitely got to like, I did, I did um, football and basketball um, cheerleading. So I got to go to all the football games and like hang out with all the cool kids that were like at the football games. But it was also a nice way for me to not ever have to reveal truly who I was to the popular kids who were sitting in the stands at the football games. Cause I would like, 
at halftime, I'd run over, like have some chit chat, eat a, you know, eat some French fries and then I'd have to get back on the field. Yeah. Um, so you didn't really have time to reveal like, oh, I'm actually a dork. You like, exactly, you exactly. Have to, I'm actually working. So it worked. I was like, yeah, sorry. I have to get back to the squad. <laughs> <laughs> did, um, did, did being in the cheerleading squad confer popularity upon you? Um, I think it more prevented unpopularity from sinking into me, which is what I was looking for because I could not have handled the pressures of being popular in school. It wouldn't have, uh, it just didn't, it didn't fit with my personality because I was frankly, incredibly weird. Uh, yeah. Be weird and popular, you know, I guess in some school, like if you go to like a, like a performing arts school, you can, but I didn't. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, and I know that you like me were a pop punk emo sure was. I had my face i wish i could have found oh actually there's a pick in here where i was all um, i was like almost in my totally in my face um i'm wearing a green zebra uh zebra print tank top that i got from hot topic <laughs> oh gorgeous well we have yeah. to have the tank top yeah and like i'm wearing a, a purple tank bandana top. i was also wearing you can't see it because i'm holding a chicken in this picture for some reason um I'm wearing a big silver chain that has just a plastic bunch of bananas at the bottom because you remember like 2006 where it was just like eh, we're random like <laughs> we're it, so random it was that like scene kid called exactly. Kid, exactly. where you're exactly. like I've got a little like bow that's like kind of out of my hair but also in my hair it's and also like Rar means love in dinosaur. <laughs> uh, loved. I still have a picture that's me like going like, eh, and I like wrote Rar. So I was very on the scene in on the New Bedford uh, hardcore and pop punk scenes, which were pretty big at the time. If we're being honest, like we got um, lots of regionally huge bands coming to venues in uh, my hometown. And I got in with the uh, pop punk and hardcore guys enough because of my older brother. Thank you very much. Shout out Bryce Darren. Um, that they let me work like the doors, like letting people in and taking money. And they would always, I'd get in for free and they'd give me like a free t-shirt, like a free, oh. like free merch. And I was just, once that kind of era of high school started happening, that was like late sophomore, early junior year. I didn't care about being popular with like my high school, like the high school kids anymore. Cause I was popular with like dudes who are certainly creeping on my 15 year old ass that I did not realize. You know? Oh, there's so much of that. And like, especially if you're like a young girl getting into pop punk scene or whatever, like you'll follow a band around. And then I remember on my space, I would like follow them and then message that be like, your music rules. And then suddenly like, actually the lead singer DMs me all the time. And like, and you're like, like what? I just like, so cool and interesting. And it's yeah, really like, cool. like, I look like I'm 12 years old and they're into that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, I, I would literally be like, this guy like thinks that I'm so like that my taste in music and my thoughts on music and like life like, are so, so interesting and it's like no he's a pedophile <laughs> no it's like he's 22 and I just must be like really mature for my age because he wants to be around me all the time and especially he's like trying to get me to sneak out late so he must think I'm like extra grown you know what I mean <laughs> yeah exactly it's a, he really wants me to try pot yeah <laughs> he, really, <laughs> he told me that there's this pill I could try I don't know I don't really like taking pills I don't even take ibuprofen but <laughs> it's like absolutely insane that I was not abducted off of MySpace oh 100 percent. I should have been kidnapped 10 or 15 times over I think that we grew up grew up in the time where it stopped being like um like before like tinder and those kind of things like people weren't meeting up like romantically it was just MySpace and kids were like meeting up at the mall to like I don't know, trade vans or whatever. And it was like totally fine. And also our parents didn't know enough about the internet to be like, don't do this. No. Like, what are you doing? Did your my did you learn code to like update your MySpace? Dude, if I had just kept going on the path of the HTML <laughs> that I learned, I could be so rich right now. There would be no way I'd be on this podcast because I'd be sitting in my penthouse apartment in Dumbo as um, like a black female coder. Are you kidding me? I would have I would have worked at Facebook. I don't I don't even give a fuck. I would have worked there. I would have sold my soul. I've thought that so many times. Like I learned code in and I retained nothing. <laughs> I retained nothing and I taught myself. 
Are you, I taught myself, I was like, you know what? I'm going to put this Motion City soundtrack song on my profile and it's going to start automatically when anyone shows up and I'm going to hide it with this code so that you can't turn it off and you have to listen to Let's Get Fucked Up and Die the whole was, time you're at my MySpace profile. You kidding me? I was me? about to ask if it was Let's Get Fucked Up and Die. Oh, absolutely. I had Dead Kennedys Kill the Poor. Hell yeah. <laughs> Oh. was my song that played automatically on my myspace and i um my bio i'll i'll never forget it my bio said if you want to know me fucking know me <laughs> i okay this is not about high school but motion city soundtrack was my absolute favorite band in high school i love them so much um before i discovered animal collective and they took over my life in fact when you said mary let it post pavilion it like triggered something deep inside yes me. It's not their best album, but it is an excellent album. Anyway, I loved Commit This to Memory. That was just like, to me, there could be like the Beatles, the James Brown, like there could be no better uh, musician yes. than the musicianship that went into making Commit This to Memory by Motion City Soundtrack. So fast forward to, I graduated college and I moved to Brooklyn. Um, my first job here in 2014 was I, um, was working at this bar that also did food. And my technical title was like, um, oh, ex Expo. So basically like people would order food on delivery apps. I would make sure that they got all the food in the right bag and like utensils and shit. And then I'd bag it up, staple it, give it to the delivery guys to like take out. One of our delivery guys uh, was the keyboardist in Motion City Soundtrack. And he, obviously this was like, in their later years so they weren't touring as much but he had and so he had a side gig when he wasn't working that's fine I don't judge yeah. him, right um and I just was starstruck I like asked him so many questions and he was so nice to me and it was like the coolest fucking thing and it was like I I just couldn't ask for anything better until one night um after the bar had closed we were all having shift drinks and we were chilling and we got we all of us got into a conversation about gentrification so we had the chat um, and it started going in a, in a direction to talk about race, obviously, because they are inextricably linked. Um, and he made the statement, so Taylor, um, tell me, answer me this question. Why are black people, no matter where they are all over the world, um, more inclined to commit violence and less inclined to be educated? Oh no. And that's when I learned not to meet my heroes. Mm. It broke my heart. Cause it wasn't even like a casual, like accidentally racist comment that like people make, uh, you know, this was like head measury, like eugenics level shit that like black people are like inherently inferior and more stupid and more violent. And I was like. When, and I will be committing that story to memory. <laughs> <laughs> And I think everyone who heard it. <laughs> oh my God. Me. This is a big one, Elise. Okay. This, big one. this was my sweet 16. <gasps> oh, you did a sweet 16. This was my sweet 16. Um, it was 80s themed. Uh, uh, for what reason? I have no idea. I was not born in the 80s. No one in this picture was born in the 80s. Um, <gasps> but I went all out. Uh, that's a, that's a Pac-Man board for a cake. I don't know. That's so know. cool. I rent, there was a vintage shop in my hometown that called Circa and they do actually like period costumes for movies and shit. Like lots of, like lots of costumes in films are from there, but they have just like all these decades and you can rent clothes from there. So I rent, I rented like an authentic eighties, like kind of Madonna look dress and had everyone else dress up like it was the eighties. And it was such a good time. Everyone in the back, like I see everyone is dressed up. Yeah. You've got an eighties. Punk on the side. Yep. We've got different variations of '80s people. It was a beautiful Actually, thing. Behind you is there's a Miami Vice type looking. Yeah, Mappachico. That's my dude. <laughs> uh, he, you know, he. I really feel like everyone dressed up. This is cool. Yeah, this was maybe one of the last parties that everyone went to before we started all drinking and like smoking. You know, it was like the last wholesome like young teen coming of age party um so, and it was so much fun did you have like a boy that you were hoping to connect with at it like what was the romantic image in your mind of your sweet 16 so I think I was too focused on myself to um focus on any boy in that, in that capacity um but every it was cool because this was like all of the different like it was so the overachievers 
were all in like one corner, like the people who I was in a student advisory council with and who like I got really good grades with. And then there were like kind of the um, people I went to middle school with who were like, degenerate's not the right word, but we were, but they were like a little, uh, like the troublemakers, if you will. Yeah. And it's then there was a middle school or a degenerate. Like sure, we <laughs> sure, sure, sure. they certainly weren't in middle school. They certainly weren't. Let's just say that the, the drug dealer who I lost uh, my secretary position to was part of that group. We'll call it that. Um, and then there were um, the athletes and then there were the drama club kids and, and show choir kids. And everyone came together to eat cake with black frosting and dance to um, Madonna songs. It was beautiful. That is that is honestly very beautiful. And that's, that's a really a wholesome, a wholesome gift. It was beautiful. Yeah. To be able to give. <laughs> but I mean, I'm like, this could have been a My Super Sweet 16, but you didn't go to Paris for the dress. No, we spent maybe $200 on that party. And a lot of it was from the job that I had at Cold Stone Creamery. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, wait. So did you have to sing? I sure did. Anytime somebody tipped us, someone could throw a nickel into the tip jar and we had to sing a song to them. Um, also, you got bonuses if you came up with songs. Um, and also sometimes would, people would tip us and be like, I'm tipping you not to sing. Please don't sing. We don't want this. And I was like. Um, damn, I feel like Cold Stone Creamery was such an institution oh, absolutely. at that time. I mean, I'm sure there still are Cold Stone Creameries, but yeah. There was a period of time in my life where Cold Stone Creamery was a big part of my life. Oh, absolutely. This Cold Stone Creamery also happened to be directly across the parking lot from the IHOP. And so I kind of flex my I work here privilege after drama club shows. Like, cause you know, you end the, you end the show and then you guys all kind of pile into somebody's mom's minivan and you go to IHOP and you just you just ruin all the employees and, and patrons at IHOP's night uh, by singing songs that are kind of like all that were like in the play earlier uh, and just being generally too loud and not tipping enough because we didn't have money. Um, One but then order food, all of you were getting up on the table. Yeah, like why were we dancing in the IHOP and those poor, poor waitresses, I felt so bad for them. It was like four, like 40 of us splitting one hash brown, you know, because that's all we could afford. Um, but afterwards, I would walk us over to Cold Stone Creamery and get us the hookup because I worked there. Wow. The power yeah. of that. It was the powerful. Power it was powerful. It was powerful. Honestly, I feel like the teen tailor that I am having, uh, that is being created for me right now is a very powerful young woman. She's like, you know what? I have a television career but it's not serving me socially. I'm going to become a cheerleader. You know what? I've been injured, but I, and I will not allow my body to be injured. So now I'm, I'm pivoting. I'm pivoting back to performance. She's having sweet 16s. There's, there's a lot of power there. You know what? Now that you say all that, I feel, I feel more powerful now than I did 12, 13, 14 years ago. And maybe that's all what it was about. Yeah. Maybe it's about looking back on your teenage self and being like, wow, were you a piece of shit? Yeah. But like, you did it. <laughs> you were your piece of shit. <laughs> you were your piece of shit. I feel like that is such a perfect place for us to wrap things up. So I am now going to ask you our final question. Can't wait. Um, we ask this of every guest, but if you were to speak to teen Taylor today, what would you tell her? Wow. Hmm. I mean, we kind of just touched on it, but yeah. any other parting thoughts? I would tell her to realize that she's hot way earlier. Like skip the whole self-loathing thing. Um, Cause you did it for years and you know, it helped you, it helped you become funny, you know, and it helped you it, like, it gave you a personality and that's great. But realize you're hot earlier um, because those years are fleeting. Yeah. Fleeting. Understand these these rock guys want to fuck you exactly and did i know but i could have realized i was just a little naive also don't take that ecstasy pill senior year because it's gonna fuck up your whole weekend that those are great pieces of advice it was mostly math if we're being <laughs> math. taylor thanks so much for coming on the pod and elise thank you for having me on this has right. been really really fun thank you all right and for everyone listening at home this has been the roast of your teenage self podcast